Characterized by her mother as sensible and studious, nine-year-old Aisha Jaquilla Degree was known to be wary of strangers and unlikely to stray far from the home that she shared with her parents, Harold and Aquila, and older brother O'Brien. In February of 2000, the Degrees lived in Shelby, North Carolina, a western suburb of Charlotte that was mostly rural at the time. Harold and Aquila were driven to provide a good life for their two children, and often worked long hours to do so. As a result, Aisha and O'Brien were latchkey kids, tasked with the responsibility of getting home after school and locking themselves inside the house until mom and dad returned from work. This was not an uncommon phenomenon in early 2000s America, and despite the amount of unsupervised time the children had, Harold and Aquila were extremely vigilant when it came to their children's safety. They led a sheltered life that revolved around church and school activities, and there was no internet access inside the Degree home. As Aquila shared with Jet Magazine in 2013, we didn't even have a computer because every time you turned on the TV, there was someone who had lured someone's child away. On the night of February 13, 2000, Aisha and O'Brien, who shared a room, were tucked into their beds around 8 p.m. without incident. About an hour later, a nearby car crash damaged the area's electrical grid, causing the Degree House to lose power for a little over three hours. When the lights came back on around 12.30 a.m., Harold checked on his children, finding both Aisha and O'Brien sound asleep in their beds. Harold himself went to bed two hours later, reporting nothing out of the ordinary. At some point between 2.30 and 5.45 a.m., Aisha got out of bed, and left her home with her pre-packed school bag. When asked about his memories of the night, O'Brien, her brother, could only recall that he heard his sister shifting in her bed at some point, but chalked it up to Aisha just changing positions. He couldn't recall anything strange, and he didn't remember her leaving. Aquila awoke on the morning of February 14, 2000, around 5.45 a.m. as usual, and began to make preparations for the day. Around 6.30 a.m., she went to wake the children and discovered that Aisha was not in her bed. Frantically, Aquila checked the house and the family's cars before phoning her mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Both women lived nearby, and Harold suggested that Aisha may have gone over to one of their houses. After it became clear Aisha's whereabouts could not be accounted for, the Degrees contacted the police. By 7 a.m., the cops had arrived with a canine unit in tow hoping to pick up the little girl's scent, but they had no luck. There were no signs of forced entry to the home, and several of Aisha's belongings were missing, including her book bag, a purse with Tweety Bird on it, and three missing outfits, one of which was reported to be her favorite. With Aisha's photo all over the news, it wasn't long before tips began to trickle into the local police station. Two separate drivers caught sight of a young girl matching Aisha's description at 3.45 a.m. and another at 4.15 a.m., respectively. She was wearing a white shirt and white jeans, one of the missing outfits, and walking along North Carolina State Highway 18 in the pouring rain. This is about 1.2 miles away from her home and follows the route her school bus took at the time. One of the motorists, Troubled by the sight of a young child by herself in the rain at such a strange hour, circled back to try and approach her, but Aisha turned and fled into the woods lining the highway. Those two incidents were the last confirmed sightings of Aisha despite years of searching and countless tips. A day after her disappearance, candy wrappers and a hair bow belonging to Aisha were found inside a shed right near where the driver reportedly saw her vanish into the woods. The next clue wouldn't appear until over a year later, in August of 2001. A construction crew dug up Aisha's backpack wrapped in plastic while building an access road in Burke County, 30 miles away from where she was last spotted. The backpack contained two items that we know of, 
a New Kids on the Block concert tee, and a copy of McElligot's Pool by Dr. Seuss. Strangely, neither item was known to be hers, but the book did come from her school's library. No further leads were generated from the backpack's discovery. In 2004, a prison inmate claimed that he knew where Aisha's body was buried, but when authorities followed his directions, only animal bones were unearthed, proving the lead to be a dead end. In the ensuing years, Harold and Aquila have kept Aisha's case alive, hosting an annual walk from their home to where she was last seen, now the site of a large billboard splashed with her missing poster. The degrees have also established a scholarship in Aisha's name. By 2016, a new clue was revealed to the public. Someone had seen a girl matching Aisha's description get into a car on North Carolina State Highway 18, near where she was spotted by the other two drivers. Described as a dark green 1970s style car with rust around the wheel wells, the vehicle is reported to be either a Lincoln Mark IV or a Ford Thunderbird. This prompted the FBI to reopen its investigation. Four years later, in 2020, a man convicted of sex crimes against children and serving 14 years at the Alexander Correctional Institution in North Carolina claimed he had information about who had killed Asia and where she was buried. After investigators interviewed him and another inmate, the tip turned out to be yet another false lead. It's widely believed that Asia left home on her own accord, even though she had no known reason to flee. Some think she may have been groomed by an adult in her life, and they convinced her to leave the house to meet them that fateful Valentine's Day. However, no suspect has ever been publicly named or identified. It is a truly baffling case since Aisha did not seem to be the type of child to just up and run away, and her lifestyle and behavior would have made a stranger's access to her quite limited. Despite the years that have passed, both authorities and the Degree family hold on to hope that someone out there knows something. And between the FBI and the local sheriff's office, a $45,000 reward is available. Aisha's mother, Aquila, prays that her daughter is alive and well, even though she was robbed of so many years with her. As she stated in an interview in 2020, we are hoping and praying that she's had a halfway decent life, even though we didn't get to raise her. She'll be 30 this year, but I don't care. If she walked in the door right now, I wouldn't care what I missed. All I want to see is her. If you're watching this and you have information about Aisha Degree's disappearance, you can call the Charlotte FBI office at 704-672-6100 or contact your local FBI office. Typically, when we think about the unsolved cases, we think about crimes that happen in the dead of night with no witnesses to tell the story. However, this isn't always the true narrative. Sometimes, crime can occur right under our noses in broad daylight. Such is the case with Eliza Sherman. This 53-year-old woman was stabbed to death in broad daylight just outside her attorney's office in downtown Cleveland, Ohio, and a suspect was caught on tape. Yet nine years on, we still don't have any answers. Eliza was a fertility nurse at the Cleveland Clinic and a mother of four. A Beechwood, Ohio native and the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, Sherman was characterized as someone who was devoted to her family. Married to Dr. Sanford Sherman for about 30 years, the couple hit a rough patch in the early 2000s, with Sanford carrying on a long-term affair from 2006 to 2010. By June of 2011, Eliza had filed for divorce, but she continued to live with her estranged husband for a year and a half, despite the growing animosity in the relationship. By 2012, Eliza was increasingly concerned for her safety and sent an email to herself documenting her fears that her husband was going to have her murdered. In addition to her husband, Eliza had also run into problems with her divorce attorney, Gregory Moore. Moore had taken over her case from his colleague, who Eliza had initially hired. However, he kept fabricating excuses to delay court appearances, even going so far as to call in bomb threats to courthouses he was due to attend. Moore had a habit of delaying his clients' cases to drag them out for as long as possible. On March 24, 2013, Moore texted Eliza, asking her to meet him at his office, 
inside the 75 Erie View Plaza building in downtown Cleveland. Her case was finally going to court in two days, and Moore wanted to prepare. Eliza arrived at Moore's law office, but he wasn't there. After waiting a while, Eliza left the office and decided to walk back to her car. Around 5.30 p.m., and only 30 feet from the entrance to the building, she was attacked, stabbed a total of 11 times in various places on her neck, back, and right arm. Hearing her screaming, an employee in the building rushed outside, but by the time he reached Eliza and called 911, she was already bleeding out and in critical condition. Eliza was pronounced dead at a local hospital 45 minutes later. Security footage from a nearby parking garage captured the suspected assailant, an individual in jeans and a hooded green or black jacket running away from the scene of the crime. It is difficult to tell if the person is male or female, but they do appear to have a limp or some kind of strange gait. None of Eliza's jewelry was stolen, and she was wearing some valuable pieces. As such, police do not believe the attack was random or unplanned. For the next two years, every lead was exhausted. Sanford, Eliza's husband, certainly had a cloud of suspicion hovering over him. Not only had their divorce been tumultuous, and he a less than ideal husband, but he also reportedly asked a friend, Larry Shanker, how to get away with murder. Additionally, just prior to her death, Eliza had discovered that Sanford was moving money, roughly $1 million, out of their joint accounts and into private ones. However, nothing Sanford had done seemed illegal, and no crime could be pinned on him, no matter how dubious he seemed in the public eye. Eventually, the city turned to the larger county government. Cleveland city officials passed the investigation over to Cuyahoga County prosecutors in 2015, the county where Cleveland is located asking them to re-examine the evidence. Finally, in January 2016, there appeared to be new clues. Cuyahoga County prosecutors indicted Moore, Aliza's attorney, on several counts, including tampering with evidence, telecommunications fraud, and forgery. Moore had claimed he was inside of his office, waiting for Aliza to attend their meeting when she was killed but witnesses as well as keycard data show that Moore left his office a full hour before Eliza arrived and did not return until well after she was slain. Though initially hopeful that this could lead to the untangling of the mystery, Moore ended up only pleading guilty to a count of falsification for giving the police misleading information on the day of the crime. He spent six months in jail and relinquished his law license in 2018. Not much has been found since. In 2021, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation and Identification formally took over the case at the request of the Cleveland Chief of Police. Elise's daughter Jennifer is reportedly heartened to learn that new eyes will be looking at the case. As she said to the Cleveland Jewish News, It's been eight years and technology has changed. I hope that they can do an analysis of DNA, if there is any, or other evidence or the video footage. Along with a fresh set of eyes, hopefully advances in the world of technology will lead to some new information as well. A $100,000 reward is currently being offered to anyone who can provide information that leads to capturing Eliza Sherman's murderer. During the early hours of the morning on October 15, 2016, 26-year-old Katie Jones was tragically gunned down on her way home. A waitress at the Midwood Smokehouse in Charlotte, North Carolina, Katie had been out with friends in the Plaza Midwood neighborhood, a trendy area known for its laid-back bars and nightlife. As the night wound down, Katie decided to walk home alone, heading along the 1300 block of the plaza towards Central Avenue. According to her friends, it wasn't unusual for Katie to walk home, even late at night. And she only lived about a mile from the popular Midwood Country Club, the bar she and her friends had frequented that evening. At 2.45 a.m., Katie, almost halfway home, was shot in the chest by an unknown assailant, and her body was found in the driveway of a real estate business shortly afterward. 
A nearby resident who had heard the shot called the police, and they arrived within minutes, but sadly, there was nothing they could do. The best lead that Charlotte police have is surveillance footage from the church across the street. The video captures about a minute of Katie walking by, not far from her home. Shortly after she passes out of frame, a car follows behind her. Police believe that Katie spoke with the occupants of the vehicle and that they are responsible for her murder. While some speculate it may have been an attempted robbery, the 26-year-old was carrying pepper spray, walking in a well-lit area, and ultimately, nothing was taken from her, including her phone and purse. Others think that gang violence may have played a role, with Katie's killing being a brutal byproduct of an initiation. Still, others believe that the crime is anything but random. One friend of Katie's was quoted saying, I don't know, it doesn't feel random. It feels like somebody saw her walking and said, let me give you a ride home. And she said no, and that may have triggered something. Speculations aside, the case is still wide open with no current suspects. Katie's mother, Javonna Livingston, though tortured by her daughter's untimely demise, has chosen to focus on how her daughter lived rather than how she died. She, alongside some of Katie's other family and friends, have set up a scholarship at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, in her honor. As Livingston says, quote, she wasn't able to stay in college because she didn't have the funding to continue. So for her to help somebody, that would be everything to her. I know she's smiling down. On the eastern side of Australia, in the far north of the state of Queensland, is the laid-back beach town of Cairns. The city enjoys a tropical climate, and its proximity to various natural features like the Great Barrier Reef make it an outdoorsman's paradise. One Cairns resident, blonde-haired dog lover Toya Cordingly, left home around 2.30 p.m. on October 21, 2018, intent on enjoying the natural scenery, but never returned. Toya was last seen alive by a passerby walking with her boyfriend's dog Indy, a large German Shepherd, Mastiff, and Great Dane mix, heading towards Wangeti Beach, about 24 miles north of the city. As the hours slipped by and night fell, there was still no sign of Toya. Her boyfriend began to raise the alarm, questioning friends and family and posting on social media. By 10.50 p.m., Toya's family reported her missing to the Cairns authorities and made plans to head out to the beach first thing in the morning. Upon reaching Wangeti Beach, Toya's blue Mitsubishi was discovered, along with Indy, tied tightly to a tree a short distance from the vehicle. Toya's mom, Vanessa, told media that the dog was, quote, tied up so tightly it couldn't sit down. Vanessa knew instantly that her daughter wouldn't have tied an animal like that. Disturbingly, not far from where her mother found Indy, Toya's father found her body in the sand dunes. The area was apparently known to be secluded and somewhat dangerous, frequented by drifters and sexual deviants. Toya's murder appeared to be sexually motivated, and her body sustained multiple visible and violent injuries. Toya's father would later write on social media, Toya is my only child. Finding her body has burnt an indelible image in my mind. It is something a father should never have to suffer. The investigation began as a massive affair, with huge search parties combing the landscape for clues and authorities attempting to account for every second of Toya's last movements. Police have remained tight-lipped throughout the investigation, only coming to the public with pleas for more information. In late 2018, the police announced to the public that they had tightened the window and were looking for vehicles in the area within a five-minute time frame on the afternoon of October 21, 2018. Not long after the police came forward looking for this information, a person of interest was identified and leaked to the press. The individual in question was Indian native Rajwinder Singh. He worked as a nurse in a hospital south of Cairns and was seen as a respectable husband and father of three children. In 2018, during the months leading up to Toya's murder, Singh began to exhibit strange behavior, taking off work for long periods and becoming increasingly withdrawn. 
This all culminated in Singh abruptly leaving town the day of Toya's death, stopping in Sydney before leaving the country altogether. Singh was seen acting strangely on the day of the crime, too, and was reportedly spotted covered in scratches and bite marks. Additionally, a combination of security footage, dash cam footage, and the location of Toya's phone, paired with the location of Singh's vehicle, was able to place him in the right area to be the perpetrator. Hiding out in India, he has maintained no contact with his friends and family in Australia. In the spring of 2021, the Australian government filed a formal extradition request with the government of India for Singh. This will allow the Indian authorities to begin tracking down the suspect. No other suspect has ever been brought to light in this case, and no lingering theories about Toya's murder seem to persist. Although it is some solace to the family that a formal suspect is being pursued, it doesn't bring Toya back, or repair the damage done by her slang. One thing is clear though, she is well-loved and deeply mourned by her community. As her mother, Vanessa Gardner, penned on what should have been Toya's 27th birthday, I will celebrate with your favorite things. Not a day passes without thinking of you, my precious. We will never give up. I love you. In the months leading up to her murder, 20-year-old Shelby Jean Thornburg Crocker was trying to shape a better life for herself. Coming from a rough family background that included an alcoholic mother, foster care, and a history of sexual assault within the system, Shelby also struggled with her weight. By 2015, she had moved out of her native rural Texas to the bustling metropolis of Houston, managed to lose 180 pounds, and was saving up money for surgery. In fact, she had paid a surgeon a $1,000 down payment for a tummy tuck on the day of her murder. Unfortunately, Shelby's way of accruing cash was somewhat risky. As an older teen, she began working as a prostitute, though she repeatedly told her sister, Christina Scott, that she was just an escort going to fancy dinners with rich guys, and nothing else. However, after being picked up twice for prostitution, once in April 2014 in Dallas County, Texas, and again in June 2015 in Houston, Shelby could no longer deny her career to her sister. Christina, fearful for her sister's well-being, warned her that she could be killed. But Shelby was too afraid to leave the trade, claiming that her boyfriend and pimp, Marcus DeWayne Johnson, would harm her. On November 4, 2015, Shelby had a session scheduled with one of her clients at her apartment near the 7500 block of Bel Air Boulevard in Houston. It is unknown if the client was new to Shelby or if they had met before, but her pimp and boyfriend was unable to provide the authorities with any meaningful knowledge about the man. At 8.33 p.m. that night, the client texted Shelby to let her know he had arrived, and he was seen on surveillance cameras at this time. He seems calm and unassuming, just a regular guy walking through a lobby. Shelby is never seen on the security cameras, meaning she likely greeted him at her apartment door. By 8.40 p.m., Shelby texted Marcus their code word, good, meaning that all was well and that she had been paid. 17 minutes later, at 8.57 p.m., the client was captured again on surveillance cameras leaving her building. He is described as a white male wearing a light-colored long-sleeved t-shirt and shorts in tennis shoes and sunglasses. There is no known age range of the suspect published by the Houston PD, but he appears to be anywhere between 20 and 40 years old. Marcus grew concerned as the minutes ticked by and Shelby remained unreachable. By 10 p.m., he arrived at her apartment to check on her and found her lying face down on her bed in a pool of blood with a deep slash across her neck. He immediately called 911, telling the dispatcher, someone is dead, someone has killed my girl. The exact murder weapon has yet to be identified, but it was a long blade like the type you might find on a chef's knife or a bowie knife. According to the blood spatter and cast off evidence, it appears that Shelby was attacked from behind while she was kneeling on her bed. Her throat was cut deeply to the spine from left to right, and then she fell forward with her assailant leaving her to bleed out and die. Many have called this a perfectly solvable crime since the killer was caught on tape and DNA evidence was present. As a result, the conduct of the Houston Police Department has been called into question. Despite Marcus clearly telling 911 that Shelby was dead, 
Houston PD didn't send homicide detectives until regular uniformed officers had confirmed the murder. This resulted in a large number of people walking in and out of the crime scene, which could have contaminated any evidence. Furthermore, DNA in the form of a hair left on Shelby's body has been run through the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, but further DNA evidence has yet to be processed. Others point to Marcus, Shelby's boyfriend, as a potential suspect and believe that the unidentified man on the camera may be innocent. After all, wouldn't the killer have been somewhat bloody, given the brutality of the crime? Shelby was reportedly frightened of Marcus and had mentioned to her sister that he would kill her if she tried to leave. However, Marcus has been cleared by authorities, and all the attention has remained on the unknown client caught on camera. Houston PD's slow movements on this case have drawn derision from the public, who believe that Shelby's status as a sex worker is the reason behind their sluggish progress. If any of our viewers know anything about Shelby's murder, you can call Houston Crime Stoppers at 713-222-8477. Do any of these unsolved cases sound familiar to you? Did we miss any theories you can think of? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.